Hello, and welcome to The Space Above Us. Episode 96, Space Shuttle Flight 26, STS-26. Return to Flight. Last time, we took a quick break and did a little update on a few space-related things that took place between 1986 and 1988. We took a brief look at the fixes to the SRB field joints, introduced a new astronaut class, and put a future shuttle destination on our radar, the Russian space station Mir. Today, the long post-accident hiatus is over, and we're back to flying. But first, I have one passing thought on that long hiatus. Was it necessary? 32 months is a pretty long time to not fly the shuttle, and the downtime was extremely disruptive to the spaceflight landscape. Critical payloads were suddenly grounded, time-sensitive science missions had to come up with new trajectories on new upper stages, and the entire astronaut corps suddenly found themselves with not much to do. So the natural question is, could the shuttle have kept flying? It sort of depends on what you view to be the root of the problem. If you view the Challenger accident as a problem with an SRB and a few specific people in the chain of command, then there's a real argument that flights could have resumed almost immediately. After all, Morton Thiokol had drawn their line in the sand at 53 degrees Fahrenheit, which isn't exactly unattainable in tropical Florida. And even then, it wouldn't have taken 32 months to come up with a heating system for the field joints to ensure that the O-rings were nice and pliable. Chuck Yeager himself said, Hell, give me a warm day and I'll fly the son of a... Well, this is a family-friendly podcast, but you get the idea. At first glance, this question seems sort of crazy, but I think it's a fair one to ask. I bet a lot of astronauts would have had no problem signing up for such a flight, even with those risks on the table, and a lot of critical payloads could have flown while long-term fixes were developed. However, there's another way to view the accident. That it was the inevitable result of a program that was sprinting as fast as it could and was bound to eventually stumble. The SRB field joints were not the only cause for concern. I also think that even if astronauts were willing to put their lives on the line, flying like that would mean more than their lives. A second accident so soon, and especially during the time when long-term fixes were being developed, would surely lead to the end of the shuttle program. And such an abrupt ending would mean an extremely long wait for another human spaceflight, maybe even an indefinite one. I think as painful and long as the wait was, giving the entire program the freedom to take a step back, inhale, exhale, and grind down some technical debt was a healthier option. But it's still interesting to think of the path not taken. And as long as that wait was, I'm sure it felt infinitely longer to class of 1978 astronaut Rick Hawk. That's because only a few months after the loss of the Challenger, Hawk was quietly informed that he was the choice to command the return-to-flight mission, flying aboard Discovery, but he had to keep it quiet. Hawk assembled his crew, who also had to keep things quiet, and got to work making sure that they were up to the task. Until the crew was publicly announced, they had to make do with shuffling in and out of the same training routine everyone else was doing to keep their skills sharp. I'm not entirely sure why the decision was made to keep the next crew quiet for so long, but my guess was that NASA was looking for stability. By letting the crew know early and having them start training, they knew they wouldn't have to publicly revise the crew manifest several times. I don't know, like I said, I'm just guessing. At this point, calls like this were made by John Young and George Abbey, and they worked in mysterious ways. You might think that given the circumstances, it might be hard to put a crew together for this flight, but you'd be wrong. Astronauts are a whole other breed, and they were tripping over themselves for the chance to fly on such an important mission. To usher the shuttle back into operational status was a dream flight. Besides, with all the scrutiny and safety improvements, the crew figured that it was the safest shuttle mission that had ever flown to that point. That said, the commander did mention breathing a sigh of relief after SRB separation. The mission also had the other historical quirk of being the first mission to return to the sane mission numbering system. Gone was STS-41B, 51I, 61A, and so on. Since West Coast shuttle launches were off the table due to the Challenger accident, it was easy to just return to a normal numbering scheme. 
Sometimes the numbers would get out of order as missions were shuffled around, but so be it. Welcome to STS-26. Let's meet the crew. For such an important mission, NASA wanted to make sure that they got things right. So for the first time since Apollo 11, we have an all-spaceflight veteran crew, which means we don't have to hear where anyone went to college. Commanding the flight was Rick Hawk. We first saw him fly as pilot on STS-7, where he and Commander Bob Crippen executed the proximity operations maneuvers around SPAS-01. We last saw him as commander on STS-51A, plucking a couple of stranded commsats out of low Earth orbit. This is his third and final flight. Joining Hawk up front was pilot Dick Covey. We last saw Covey flying on STS-51I, which culminated in Ox Van Hoften wrestling a SYNCOM satellite that had also been stranded in low Earth orbit. As Ox manually spun SYNCOM up, pushing it away, Covey and 51A Commander Joe Engel operated the Orbiter RCS thrusters to chase it down. Fun fact, Covey was the first person to fly as shuttle pilot twice, but not the first person to fly as pilot on their second shuttle flight. Steve Nagel flew as a mission specialist on STS-51G and then as a pilot on STS-61A. Yeah, that one's definitely coming up on Trivia Night. Oh, and we've actually heard from Covey more recently, since he was the Ascent Capcom for STS-51L, meaning it was his voice you heard saying, Challenger, go at throttle up. This was his second of four flights. In the back of the flight deck, we find Mission Specialist 1, John Lounge. We last saw Lounge waking up from a nap on the orbiter wall and frantically strapping back into his seat before STS-51I could lift off. Incidentally, I saw Dick Cubby say that he doesn't think Lounge ever actually got strapped in since he was out of his seat suspiciously quickly after main engine cutoff. This is Lounge's second of three flights. Joining Lounge on the flight deck was Mission Specialist 2, Dave Hilmers. We last saw Hilmers on STS-51J, which was notable for being the first flight of Atlantis, as well as that annoying mission where it was classified for no apparent reason. The payload was originally unclassified, and everybody knew what it was, a military commsat, and where it was going, geostationary orbit. Oh well. This was his second of four flights. And last but not least, Mission Specialist 3, Pinky Nelson. One of the few astronauts to don the manned maneuvering unit, we know Nelson from STS-41C, where he accidentally got the Solar Max mission spinning up a little fast before later helping to fix it and STS-61C, deploying a commsat and hanging out with Congressman Bill Nelson, no relation. And since STS-61C was the last flight before the Challenger accident, that means that he's flying again pretty soon when looking at the mission list, even if it was nearly three years between flights. Interestingly, Rick Hawk's oral history seems to imply that Nelson had already left NASA or was on some sort of hiatus, since George Abbey, the Director of Flight Crew Operations Directorate, and the guy who chooses the crews, said he had called Nelson up at the University of Washington to ask if he'd come back. I guess he did, because here he is on his third and final flight. The mission at hand was actually pretty simple as far as shuttle flights go. Certainly not as complicated as some of the stuff we've already seen. The primary objective was to deploy Tedris C, which would be taking the place of the Tedris B spacecraft lost on Challenger. Building up NASA's communications network was certainly an important objective, but it wasn't exactly all that complicated. There was also a whole bunch of mid-deck experiments that we'll talk a little about, but the real goal of this flight was to get up there and get back. In other words, to get the shuttle program flying again. Training for the mission didn't differ too much from training for previous missions. After all, there was nothing the crew could do about an SRB malfunction, so there was nothing to train for. However, there was one notable change that did require an update to the training. Pressure suits. The first four shuttle missions saw their two-person crews flying with pressure suits. That's because this was the orbital flight test era, and there was a chance that the crew might be forced to use their ejection seats. But starting with STS-5, the vehicle was declared operational. The ejection seats were deactivated and later removed, and the pressure suits went off to museums or wherever old pressure suits go. Instead, the crew wore simple flight suits and helmets. The helmets resembled motorcycle helmets, but actually separated into two pieces. 
I'm not sure what the flight suits were made out of, but as far as I know, it was nothing special. After all, the whole point was that the shuttle was a shirt-sleeve environment. Airline pilots don't wear pressure suits either. After Challenger, that changed. Crews would now spend launch and entry wearing the creatively named launch entry suits. The suits consisted of a lower layer that was basically like long underwear, then pressure bladders, a nylon layer to help keep everything in place, and an outer layer of fireproof Nomex material. And on top of that, they wore a parachute harness, and naturally a parachute. The suits wouldn't be able to handle an EVA, but they would keep you conscious in a depressurized cabin, giving the crew a chance to try to land safely or bail out. Originally, the suits were a dark blue color, but concern was raised about how visible that would be on a raft in the ocean. As Dick Covey put it, quote, If we're going to look stupid in them anyway, might as well look orange. Sure, okay, words to live by. The introduction of the suits caused minor tweaks to the typical procedures, but also meant that crews had to train for all sorts of off-nominal scenarios that previously weren't possible. They had to learn how to skydive, how to survive for long periods in the water, how to rappel down the side of the orbiter, stuff like that, all while wearing the suits. They also had to learn how to use a piece of equipment with one of my favorite names in spaceflight, the escape pole. The real intent of the suits was to allow the crew to survive a situation where a safe landing was impossible, but where they still had full control over the vehicle. The orbiter would be put into a stable glide, and a crew member, called the jump master, would get to work. First, they'd pull a handle to equalize the pressure between the cabin and the ambient pressure outside. This way, when they did what came next, all the air wouldn't just explosively blast through the hatch. Because what happened next was another handle was pulled, causing pyrotechnics in the hatch hinge to fire and thrusters to activate, blasting the door away at 30 miles an hour. At that point, the way out was clear, but they still weren't done. If a crew member jumped through the hatch now, they'd be likely to smack into the left wing. This is where the escape pole comes in. It was mounted on the ceiling of the middeck and could be extended 10 feet out the side hatch. Crew members would slip a loop of material around it and slide down the pole, clearing the wing. From there, their parachute would automatically deploy, but there was also a manual override. It's a lot to keep track of, but even with 8 people, it would only take about 90 seconds for everyone to jump out safely. All told, the new suit, helmet, harness, and parachute weighed about 70 pounds. That's not the best, but with the weight distributed all around you, it's not so bad. Though it did make getting into and out of their seats a little more cumbersome. And that wasn't the only small issue. For example, the environmental control system was designed to handle an excess oxygen flow rate of 20 pounds per hour. But with the oxygen systems on the suits running during ascent, the cabin had to deal with 25 pounds per hour. And actually, on this flight, they recorded 28 pounds per hour, with the likely cause being that one of the crew members hadn't closed their visor. Another minor issue was when an alarm went off just before launch, a DPDT alarm. This stands for a change in pressure, and usually would indicate that there was a cabin leak. Instead, the computer was reacting to an unusual amount of extra air in the cabin, leaking out of the suits. But my favorite suit-related issue was once the crew got to orbit and started putting their seats away, they found that they couldn't fold them up with the parachutes attached. Their solution was to leave the seats unfolded and just stick them into the airlock to float around out of the way. This issue was noted in the anomaly list with the perhaps slightly passive-aggressive corrective action. Remove parachutes prior to seat folding as designed. I guess even astronauts make dumb mistakes. Alright, that's enough about the suits. Everyone get them on, get in the Astro Van, and let's head to 39B and pile into Discovery. I hope they're comfortable though, spoiler, they're not, since the crew was going to have to spend a while on the pad. The dreaded upper level winds were acting up again. These are always the worst, since the weather seems perfectly fine on the ground, but things can be a little different a few miles up. The winds caused an hour-long delay, since there was concern that they could exceed the safe structural limits of the wings. Eventually, though, they looked at the data from previous flights and how they had handled similar winds and realized that they actually had plenty of margin after all. No problem. The countdown continued, only to be interrupted again. The fuses controlling the fans and the pressure suits of Covey and Lounge had burned out and needed to be replaced. 
Ah, the little things. Really, though, considering how much downtime there was and the stakes of this mission, that's not too bad. Just two minor issues. They didn't even scrub. On September 29th, 1988, at 11.37 a.m., the three main engines roared to life, Flame rushed down the lengths of the solid rocket boosters, and Discovery leapt off of the launch pad for the seventh time. Aboard Discovery, Ascent went smoothly with only some minor issues. The most serious problem was when the flash evaporator had a high load and had to be shut down. One thing I thought was funny was that Commander Hawk had noticed a minor warning and didn't think much of it at first, but was sort of unnerved when Mission Control didn't radio up to say there was nothing to worry about. Mission Controllers later said they didn't want to distract the crew when they were busy during Ascent, but their politeness actually distracted Hawk more. After 8 minutes and 33 seconds, the main engine shut down. One ET SEP and an Ohms 2 burn later, and the crew were in a 301 by 313 kilometer orbit. Later analysis showed that the SRBs worked great, with no cause for concern with their performance. The O-rings were in excellent condition, and I think there's a good chance that that will be the last time I ever have to say the word O-ring. The ascent wasn't completely trouble-free, however. It was unclear if it was debris from the external tank or from the SRBs, but something fell off and impacted the thermal tiles under the right wing. The impact resulted in a gouge, 18 inches long, 6 inches wide, and about an inch and a half deep. We'll talk about the significance of that damage when we get to entry. Interestingly, the anomaly report seems to imply that this was debris from the SRB, since all of the corrective actions were oriented around cork insulation placed around the redesigned field joints. If a chunk of cork had come loose, it could have caused the damage. It just goes to show how even a seemingly minor change like adding a little insulation to the side of the SRBs can have bigger repercussions than expected. A little over six hours after liftoff, the primary objective of STS-26 was completed, as Tedris C was successfully deployed, drifting serenely away. Eight minutes later, the pilot crew fired Discovery's Plus X RCS thrusters to move away from the spacecraft, and seven minutes after that, fired the Ohms engines for 16 seconds to move into a separate orbit. Both stages of Tedris C's inertial upper stage later fired, raising the communication satellite's orbit and allowing it to move into its geostationary box. In January of 1989, it entered service and was renamed Tedris 3. Tedris 3 has relayed communications between countless NASA missions and remains operational to this day, but is considered in storage and not an active member of the constellation. Flight Date 2 got started with a jolt of energy. For the crew's wake-up song, special guest Robin Williams had recorded a message, belting out, Good Morning Discovery! Which was followed up with a not-terrible space-based parody of the Green Acres theme song, put together by folks on the ground. With the main objective done, the rest of the mission was pretty relaxed, with the crew focusing on Earth observation, orbiter housekeeping, and a slew of mid-deck experiments. I'm not going to go into all of these experiments, but I'll at least rattle a couple of them off. We've got the Automatic Directional Solidification Furnace, the Infrared Communications Flight Experiment, the Isoelectric Focusing Experiment, Aggregation of Red Blood Cells, and the Mesoscale Lightning Experiment. For best potential band name in there, I'm going to go with Aggregation of Red Blood Cells. It wasn't all fun and games, though. As usual, there were a number of minor problems to be ironed out. When the KU band antenna was deployed, it seemed to be doing well, but the antenna soon failed a self-check routine and began oscillating around. The crew tried to stow it, but couldn't get it to stop oscillating. The mission report notes that, quote, an alternative stowage procedure was developed, but doesn't give any details. Reading between the lines, I think they just waited for it to randomly oscillate into one of the lock positions and then quickly engage the locks. Bummer, no high data rate for you but at least it's not a space lab mission, so no data would be lost. Another issue cropped up when the crew attempted to use the Crew Optical Alignment Site, or COAS, mounted near the forward windows of the flight deck. This is a precise instrument that allows the crew to spot specific stars and calibrate the onboard navigation system, just like we're used to from Apollo. Unfortunately, the COAS seemed to be off by about 2 degrees. The crew noted that it was missing a nut on its adapter plate, but that they had fixed it by using some tape. 
the anomaly report then says, quote, A recommendation was made to the crew that this plus X calibration not be used, and that the minus Z overhead window calibration be used instead. Which I interpreted as, hey, yeah, that's great. Can you just use the non-busted calibration site instead? One last one. Apparently, there was a VCR on board. You know, a video cassette recorder. Records to a video home system tape, VHS. One of those big bulky machines that we used to use to record analog video in the king of all resolutions, 480i. <laughs> I'm not sure what they were using it for, but... A tape got jammed and had to be cut out using scissors, resulting in a small amount of lost video. And I thought it was funny that, quote, The crew noted that the video cassette recorder and cameras are older designs and recommended replacement with some state-of-the-art equipment. Are you calling NASA's VCR old and busted? How dare you? Oh, and during all these minor issues, the crew got to deal with a delightful cabin environment of 88 degrees Fahrenheit, that's 31 degrees Celsius, and 64% humidity thanks to the issues with the flash evaporator. Yuck. In addition to the crew's minor discomfort, a close eye had to be kept on electronic systems to ensure that they were getting the proper amount of cooling from the limited cooling resources. The flight proceeded smoothly as the crew of five went about their work, but they carried with them the memories of seven others. Every member of the STS-26 crew had been close personal friends with at least one member of the Challenger crew, and their memory was a strong presence on the flight. The crew's photo was even posted on the wall of the mid-deck. And on the day before re-entry, the STS-26 crew gathered to read a touching tribute to the men and women of STS-51L. Commander Hawk concluded the remarks by saying, Today, up here, where the blue sky turns to black... We can say at long last to Dick, Mike, Judy, to Ron and L, and to Krista and Greg. Dear friends, we have resumed the journey that we promised to continue for you. Dear friends, your loss has meant that we could confidently begin anew. Dear friends, your spirit and your dream are still alive in our hearts. And with that, STS-26 completed another unsaid mission objective. They had done right by the Challenger's crew. That's not to say that the entire mission was this somber, however. Speaking over some footage shot over the mission, one crew member later said, We did want to communicate, particularly to the youth of the country, that space is a fun place. And even though we went through a terrible tragedy several years ago, we still want to communicate that there are some things up there that are unique. We want to really inspire the youngsters to take an interest. The footage playing as he said this was one crew member standing on another crew member's back and surfing across the mid-deck floor, while both wore Hawaiian shirts. Astronauts, another breed. Actually, the Hawaiian shirts were significant on their own. The folks who worked on Discovery in the Orbiter Processor Facility had a tradition of wearing loud and colorful shirts to work on a regular basis. Sort of like casual day. The most casual day. When the crew came to visit, the shuttle workers presented them with their very own brightly colored Hawaiian shirts. The crew decided to wear them on orbit as a nice nod to all of the hard hours the shuttle workers had put into keeping these five men safe. One other quick note about the shirts, Pilot Covey said that at this point the crew's clothing options actually expanded quite a bit. I hadn't heard this before, but it sounds like they were required to choose from a fairly limited pool of clothes that were known to be safe with the orbiter systems. Starting with this flight, they could just go pick stuff from Land's End and have it personalized. That made me laugh because I work on the Restore L mission, and when the email went out telling us how to get personalized gear with the Restore L mission patch on it, where did they send us? Land's End. This episode brought to you by Land's End, I guess. The brief mission was over before you knew it. The Ohm's engines fired, the orbiters slewed to the entry attitude, and just over four days after lifting off from Florida, Discovery slipped past entry interface. While no test maneuvers were flown during this entry, an interesting change was being closely monitored. Some tiles near the chin area of the orbiter were carefully smoothed down in order to be less disruptive to passing air. 
This is noteworthy because later analysis showed that it resulted in the tenuous upper atmosphere passing over Discovery's body in a laminar, or smooth, state significantly longer than previous flights. This is important because when air transitions to turbulent flow, the heating effects encountered at hypersonic speeds are greatly amplified. And it's also important because remember that gouge under the right-hand wing? Its effects were minimized by the nice smooth airflow. Which is good, because even with the smooth flow, there was some unusual heating damage to some tiles. And if there had been more turbulent flow, it may have done actual structural damage. Debris impacts on the thermal protection system had always been a problem and would remain one for the duration of the program. Discovery touched down at Edwards Air Force Base after 4 days, 1 hour, and 11 seconds, traveling at over 200 miles per hour. And in one more sign of the improvements made during the downtime, the brakes worked just fine, with no work needed before their next use. After the vehicle was safe, a technician entered the orbiter and gave the crew a large American flag. An hour after landing, they proudly walked down the stairs with the flag aloft and greeted a surprise guest of honor, Vice President George H.W. Bush. STS-26 had been a complete success. This was an interesting little mission. In a vacuum, get it, it's almost completely unremarkable. Fly up, punch out a commsat, do a couple of mid-deck experiments, no significant issues, head home. But in context, it was an enormous success. The shuttle program, NASA, and the United States had suffered a shocking trauma with the loss of Challenger and its crew. But this flight proved that we still had what it took to dream big and get stuff done. Was everything fixed and the shuttle a perfectly safe vehicle? No, of course not, but that wasn't its job. Its job was to do the things that no other spacecraft could do, what no other nation could do, and to inspire countless people along the way. And it was back to doing just that. Next time, remember that big backlog of DoD payloads I talked about? Yeah, Atlantis is back on the launch pad and we have another classified mission on our hands. Don't worry though, while we don't know much about what happened during the mission proper, We'll still have a few things to say, and we'll get to hear about a few choice words from Commander Hoot Gibson. Ad Astra, catch you on the next pass. Mm-hmm.